voices of your people this morning. And all of God's people say, Amen. Darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know Why won't you shake Why won't you shake It's my fear Yeah. 
you to listen to that. No, there's nothing that's been wasted. No failure, no mistake. The enemy will tell you different. He'll tell you, you've messed up. How can you stand before me? But you know what he says? That there's no mistake, no failure that you have made that I can't turn for whose glory? His and for your good. So as we're singing this, I want you to make it your anthem. If you've ever felt not worthy enough, or God, why would you have me do that or say this or do this and look where I am now? Or give that up because look where I am now. Don't remind yourself of where you were. Remind yourself of whose you are. Because there's power in that. There's power in that. There's power in these confessions. Lord, when I doubt it, because we do, remind me I'm wonderfully made and that you are the artist and I'm the canvas. You come do in me what you need done. Amen. Let's sing that again, Josh. And I want every voice lifted. I don't care what you sound like. You make this your declaration this morning. Remind yourself of whose you are. Hallelujah. When I doubt it, remind me I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and the potter on the canvas and I'm the clay. And I know nothing has been wasted, no failure. Just the voice. 
voices for your glory and for your name cause you make all things work together for my future and for It's in your name that all things will bow, all confess that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. You are Alpha and Omega. You are Abba Father. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are El Shaddai. Oh, you are, you are. Oh, your name.
Yes, come on, let's give the Lord a praise in this house. Father, all praise and all honor to your name. All praise and all honor to your name. Oh, the King of kings. Well, praise God. To his, in his name, we have victory. Amen. 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 Well, we, we need to go to the Lord in prayer today. And first of all, I want to remind you just to pray for all of our teachers and all of our administrative staff that are going back to school or figuring out how to do this thing online, whatever, whatever case they're, they found themselves in. We need to pray for them. Then we've had a couple of babies born this week. Uh, little Joe. Uh, has a new baby. Shana has a new grandson. We're thankful for new life, and we appreciate, uh, you know, all that comes with that. And then we need to pray for Lily, that God would just touch her and heal her and her husband. And and then I just, I, if you haven't heard, uh, Mario Balderrama passed away yesterday. So we need to pray for Patty and the rest of the family, that God would comfort them and and strengthen them and bless them. I've seen this so many times over the years. We, we have an increase in life and then we have a decrease by death. But how many of you know Mario is now walking in the presence of Jesus? His battle in this life is over, but he has a new experience that all of us will experience someday. Amen. And we, we hold on to those words of, of comfort and peace and joy because nothing can steal our joy. Amen. Amen. So you pray with me over these needs. Father, we thank you for the day. God, we're so grateful and appreciative of, of the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name. The name when it is mentioned, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord. And Father, I thank you for that we can pray in this name. We, we had the authority to, to, to claim the name of Jesus as we pray. Lord, I, I pray for every teacher. I pray for every administrative personnel, God, from, from the superintendent on down to the janitorial staff. Lord, I, I realize, God, that, that all are important in the education of our children. Father, I pray you anoint them, you bless them, you encourage them, you strengthen them. Lord, you give them wisdom for the days to come. And Father, I just lift Patty to you. Lord, I pray for her family. God, you strengthen them during the loss of, of Mario. God, you just encourage them and bless them and, and lift them high. Lord, we know, God, that, that sorrow comes like a thief in the night, but joy comes in the morning. Lord, one day we're going to celebrate together with all the things that Mario is experiencing now. Father God, we're all going to, we're all going to just experience those, those blessings and that favor. And Lord, we rejoice in that fact, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you for uh, praying with us and worshiping with us. Now it's time for us to just continue our worship and receiving the Lord's tithe and, and our offering today. And I just thank you in advance for your faithful support. Remember, we've got these boxes on the four columns and around the walls of the sanctuary. And uh, the worship team's going to lead us back into worship. Thank you for giving this morning. God bless your heart. Well. By your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. By your spirit.
is everybody? Good. So I have some exciting news. We are getting our kids started again. Amen? Woohoo! Everybody celebrate. I have enjoyed being in here with you, but y'all are not as much fun as they are. I'm sorry. So we are going back to Kids Church starting next Sunday. So next Sunday we will be back there. So if you have kiddos, um, it will be a little different. Um, so just be prepared. If we ask that only one parent take them back, um, we will have somebody at the computers logging you in. So that way not everybody is touching the computer system and everything. So you'll get your name tag. Take your kids to their room. They will have their temperature checked before they walk through the doors. We will immediately wash hands. So we're doing everything we can to protect them, keep them safe. Um, but we do need your part as well. We need you to make sure just one person checks them in, checks them out, preferably the same person if possible. I know that's not always the case, but if you can, that would be great so that way we know faces and, um, and everything. Uh, and we'll be doing that with teachers as well. Everybody that comes through our rooms will have their temperatures checked, hands washed. Um, we'll have some san hand sanitizer everywhere. Um, we'll be wiping everything down, doing everything we can to keep them safe, but still allowing them to have fun and get back to what they know, right? And Wednesday services will be starting those, the kids' Wednesday kids' services. That will start back on September 9th. So Royal Rangers and our girls, I think Steph, Y'all are starting youth this Wednesday, so youth, this Wednesday, y'all will start having. So all of my kids that have graduated and are now in sixth grade, seventh grade on up, y'all will be able to go to youth, so remind, you know, so remember to move up. I'm going to miss y'all, though. I will cry, but I know y'all have fun in youth, so make sure y'all start at 7 o'clock, Seth? 7 o'clock in the youth room back here, okay? So y'all will start this Wednesday. Kids start, nope. In here, sorry, I lied. In here, not in the youth room. You'll, you'll meet in here Wednesday, 7 o'clock. Next Sunday, kids' church for um, and nursery. We'll have nursery through fifth grade back there. And then Wednesday, kids will start up September 9th. Got it? Are y'all excited? I am excited. All right, Pastor, you can take it away. All right, thank you, Shelly. Shelly does a good job with your kids. If you haven't figured that out, I should have got a bigger amen than that. Well, Shelly should have got a bigger amen than that. So it's all good. All right. Well, so while we're singing that song about the name of Jesus, I thought back to a, a family text we had going one time a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, a month ago. You know how time gets away. Uh, my son, who pastors in San Angelo, started, you know, shouting the names of God, you know. So everybody kind of joined in, El Shaddai, um, El, Shal El Shalom, Jehovah Jireh, all of, one after another just kept shouting those names. Well, I threw in Jehovah Sidkenu. Anybody know what Jehovah Sidkenu means? Two of you. That's kind of the way they responded. They just got quiet. Actually, that means the Lord is our righteousness. So, 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 so it doesn't matter how righteous you are. It's his righteousness that counts for you. Amen. All right. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. Okay. So we're going to continue on our series about questions and answers uh, about the Holy Spirit. And... Today we're going we're gonna to begin talking about gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there are nine gifts of the Holy Spirit that generally are referred to, but there are a lot more gifts lined out in Scripture. We're going we're gonna to limit our talk to the nine. We're going to take three this week, three next week, and three the week following, but there are there are literally 21 gifts listed in Scripture. So, so there are a lot more than these nine. But let's look at Hebrews chapter 2 and then 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to go there, spend most of our, my time there. But I got a lot of other Scripture for you. We'll have most of it up on the screen. And, um, 
And then it's in your notes as well. You can take it home, study it, look at it, dig a little deeper um, at different things that uh, the Lord directs your heart to. So here's what Hebrews chapter 2, verse 4 says. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders. How many of you know signs and wonders are a good thing? They are an absolute good thing with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. That's, that's vitally important that we, that we understand that God gives gifts according to his will. He uses people in gifts according to his will. He performs miracles according to his will. He, he does signs and wonders according to his will. So we can't override his will. He alone is God. My, my daughter used to wear a t-shirt on the front and said, there is a God. And on the back it said, and you ain't him. Right? So, so we understand God has, God has this great this, this great will, and it is according to his, his will. Well, there are 21 gifts listed in Scripture, and we're going to look at nine gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So if you'll read with me there, we're going to read verse 7 through 11. Here's what verse 7 says. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For, so it's, it's for the profit of all. I, I just kind of wore that point out last week that the gifts of the Spirit should be used for the exhortation, for the building up, for the encouragement of the body of Christ. Here he says it's for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each individually as he wills. There we have that phrase again, as God wills, as he desires, he, he distributes each gift to each um, individual. Now, for years, for uh, literal um, centuries, uh, authors, uh, scholars have, have broken these nine gifts down into three main uh, gifts, And that's the way we're going to look at them. Um, it's perfectly acceptable to look at them that way. First of all, there's gifts of revelation. Gifts of revelation. That's wisdom, knowledge, and discernment. And then there's gifts of power. That's faith, miracles, and healings. And then there's gifts of utterance, prophecy, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. So we're going we're gonna to look at those in those three settings. Now, David Lim, who is a more recent um, theological scholar, he points out that they should be grouped differently, that they should be grouped according to the original uh, Greek. And it should be broken down like this, teaching and preaching gifts for leadership, verse 8. One is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit to another, the same kind, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. Ministry gifts, uh, which is directed to the church and to the world. Um, and then worship gifts to another, uh, different kinds of tongues and to another interpretation of tongues. For simplicity's sake, we're going to group them with the traditional grouping. And Lim says it's perfectly acceptable. It's perfectly Fine. So, so we're going to we're going to look at that. So, so let's begin with the word of wisdom. The word of wisdom is what we're we're going to start with. Now, now here's what we know about. Um, the, there, there, there's, there's a couple of givens concerning wisdom and knowledge. Okay, we we know that knowledge is the gleaning of information. It's the gleaning of information, and we know wisdom is the proper use of information. In other words, knowledge is a gathering of facts, and wisdom is the proper use of those facts. It is, it's, uh, it's what we, you know, 
in our West Texas slang, we called it common sense. Now, how many of you know common sense is different wherever you grew up? Common sense can mean one thing here in Eastern New Mexico. It can mean something else in Arkansas. But, but it's common. So, so wisdom is that it's the right use of the facts that you receive. And it is exactly the same sense in a supernatural operation of a gift of the Spirit. It's exactly the same. A knowledge, a word of knowledge is that gleaning of facts and wisdom is the proper use of, of information. So, so we're going to look at wisdom. So David Lim says the gift is a message or a proclamation or a declaration of wisdom and does not mean that those ministering the message are necessarily wiser than others. It doesn't mean that they're wiser than you. It doesn't mean they're smarter than you. It just means that God supernaturally imparted something down in their soul that they can declare, that they can proclaim to the rest of the body of Christ. It's a supernatural event. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2, uh, chapter in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, Paul shows us that we cannot depend on human wisdom. In fact, look at this. He says in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 21, he says, the world through wisdom did not know God. The world through wisdom did not know God. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5, he says, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So, so what we're talking about is not just natural wisdom, but it is a supernatural impartation of wisdom given to us by the Holy Spirit. And then James goes on to say in chapter 3, verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above, the wisdom that is from God is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. The wisdom that is from above is first pure. God's wisdom is pure. Well, let's, one, let's look at what does the Bible say about this gift of, this word of, of wisdom? I'll tell you this, Scripture never really describes a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge or the discerning of spirits. Never really kind of gives us a, a definition. So, so we're, going to, we're going to look at the context and then we're going to look at some biblical examples. So, so here's what we know about the, first of all, about the context of a, of a word of wisdom. The context tells us that they are, that it is supernatural. It is, it is a supernatural outpouring of the Spirit of God upon an individual. And we may look at them and go, how in the world did they glean that information? How did they come up with that kind of wisdom? How did they, how did they speak those things? So, so it, is more, it is no more human wisdom than tongues is a flare for languages. It, it's not described as a gift of wisdom or a gift of knowledge, but as, but as the gifts of a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge. Donald G. tells us that this implies a spoken utterance through a direct operation of the Holy Spirit at any given moment rather than a, an abiding deposit of supernatural wisdom. And here's how a word of wisdom works. It, it works in the sense that, that someone has made a deposit by the Holy Spirit. They utter that word. They speak that word. It doesn't remain in them. It doesn't hold fast to them. It doesn't come from anything that they've developed in their own life over their own years, but it is supernatural in effect. So a gift of the word of wisdom manifests the purposes, plans, and designs of God in a particular situation. So a word of wisdom manifests the purposes, plans, and designs of God in a particular situation. Okay, so we're going to look at 
some spiritual, or pardon me, some scriptural exam, examples. So, so here's, here's number one. The Holy Spirit will give what we need when we face opposition. The Holy Spirit will impart to you how to reply, how to respond, how to react, how to act in a given situation, in a given time, when opposition comes against you. In fact, let's look at Luke chapter 21, verse 15. He said, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. I don't know about you, but that's powerful. So here's a mouth and wisdom is a Semitic way of saying an utterance of wisdom or a word of, of wisdom. In Luke chapter 12, verse 11 through 12, now when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what to say, how to respond, how to, how to declare your, your faith in Jesus, how, how he believes you. In Mark chapter 13, verse, verse 11, he said, but when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak, but whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speaks, but the Holy Spirit. Isn't that that's just powerful that, that God will drop in your heart what you need to say. Now, this is to totally different from, from the scripture when Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance things that you need. Listen, those things we've got to have uh, installed in our heart. We've got we've to implant them in our heart and then the Holy Spirit will bring them to our remembrance. This is something totally different. It's supernatural gift from the Holy Spirit. He said, I will give you what you need. We read about Stephen who was full of the Holy Spirit and he received a word of wisdom. You remember Stephen, he was one of the seven uh, deacons that were chosen in Acts chapter six when the Grecian women were complaining, hey, we're not being taken care of. And so the apostles said, well, choose out seven men full of the Holy Spirit. We'll appoint them to, to serve over you, to serve tables. It's, it's, it wouldn't be good for us to leave prayer and study the word to serve you, so we'll appoint these. Well, Stephen was one of those seven men. And then Stephen received a, a word of, of wisdom in Acts chapter six, when, when they had gathered together and were, and were uh, blaspheming and challenging the word of God. In Acts chapter six, verse 10, it says this, they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Stephen was given a word of wisdom. Now listen, well, here's what we know about Stephen. He was martyred even after he was given this word of wisdom. So here's what we know. It's interesting to note that Stephen died right after he was given the word of wisdom. It was not given to him to get him off the hook, but to give a clear testimony of Christ and fulfill God's purpose. So sometimes that word of wisdom you get may make them matter at you, but we take it. We just make a stand and believe that God is at work. So number two, the Holy Spirit, what we give you, what will, the Holy Spirit will give what we need when we're facing a crisis. In Acts chapter 15, the church was facing a crisis, and it could have been so destructive uh, for, for the church. But in, in my opinion, Peter and James used supernatural wis wisdom to give direction to the church. I don't really have time to go into it, but they knew they had the mind of God because in the letter they wrote, they said, and this is Acts chapter 15, verse 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. 
So I, I'm just, so the Holy Spirit will give you what you need when that moment arises. There have been times when things have come out of people that are so anointed, so profound, we know without question it was from God, right? There, there, just, there just can be no question, can be no, no, when God chooses to use you, you will know it's him. Okay, so we're going to move on to the word of knowledge. Well, what is knowledge? There are two things we need to understand about knowledge. Number one, knowledge understands something that has been revealed or to be in possession of the facts. To, to be without knowledge is to be ignorant about something or to be fooled by what is not true. So the number two, the biblical concept of knowledge implies a relationship. We read in the Old Testament from Genesis all the way through about men knowing their wives. Adam knew Eve and uh, she conceived and bore a son. So, so knowledge from its very foundation has to do with a relationship. Knowledge about God entails a revelation of him and a right relationship with him. So we got to know that, that we, he reveals things about himself to us, but it comes from a right relationship with God. We know him. We know the way he thinks. We know the way he operates. We, we, know, his, we know his character. We know his, we know his ideals. We know his philosophies. We know things about God that we can only know from Scripture or he supernaturally imparts to us. So Donald G. suggests the gift of the word of knowledge has its root in the office of the teacher in the church and, and is not alone in the natural power of analysis, logic, and exposition, but a manifestation of the Holy Spirit operating by divine illumination, revealing divine nature. Stanley Horton tells us this, a revelation of someone's need to inspire prayer in a crisis or intercession where we are praying and believing God, a revelation of, a, of the cause of a sickness or a demon possession. So, so we have those things. Okay, so, so we're gonna, we know that this gift is given by the Holy Spirit. I want to take you to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. Here's what the Bible says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from darkness. So here's what we have here. Verse 1 says what God intended. He, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then there was confusion and darkness. But God didn't leave that confusion and darkness alone. The Spirit of God hovered above the darkness. The Spirit of God was prevalent, was always there, was always working, was always moving. And then God said, let there be light. Now, this is not light from the sun. It's not light from any other source. It's not light from the sun reflecting off the moon. It's not light from the stars. But God said, let there be light. He created a supernatural light that would cause the darkness and confusion to leave. That is a word of knowledge. That is how God works. Well, let's look. What does the Bible say? There are three things that can be said about a word of knowledge. First of all, the knowledge is supernatural, just like in the word of wisdom. It is not a permanent resource of information, but a gift of the Holy Spirit who can impart knowledge to the believer that the believer does not normally possess. It is, it is, it is, an, it is God dropping facts down in our heart that there's no way we could know. 
We haven't studied it in the past. We haven't learned it from somebody else. But God supernaturally drops that knowledge, those facts, down into our heart. Number two, this knowledge will contain both moral and spiritual value. So, so here, here's the, the dividing line. Most scholars believe that it operates specifically with the ministry of Bible teaching. That's, that's back up to what Donald G. was saying about it's associated with the, the teaching gift. That, that idea that, that, uh, that God can drop something in our heart while we're teaching. I'll be honest with you. There, I've had experiences when it, was, it wasn't from my notes, it wasn't anything that I had studied, but God supernaturally dropped a word of, of knowledge down into my heart, and, and I was able to share it with the congregation. And can I tell you something? That profoundly affected people. Because it's, because it's, a, it's a gift from the Holy Spirit. It doesn't, doesn't mean that something special or supernatural lies within me other than the Holy Spirit. But he has that ability to bring those things out of anybody at any time. The knowledge is a revelation of the secrets and truths of God. The secrets and truths of God. The secrets and truths about God, about his relationship with his people, about how much he loves you, about how much he cares for you, about how much he wants to minister to you. So we've got some scriptural examples. In the book of 2 Kings, chapter 6, verse 9 through 12, this was to warn a king of an enemy's plan of destruction. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. And then he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice, but it happened over and over again. As the king of Syria was about to move upon the nation of Israel, God would use Elisha to speak into the king's life, Watch out. Don't go there. Don't go. Don't, don't follow through with this plan because the king of Syria is going to be there. Now, I want you to watch the response of the king of Syria in verse 11. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? In other words, he thought I had a spy in his own camp. Somebody's got to be telling him what we're doing, what we're planning, what we're what we're doing. And then one of his servants said, None, my Lord. But Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your own bedroom. How could he know that? It was a supernatural manifestation of a word of knowledge. So Let's look down in 2 Kings chapter 5. This was to expose a hypocrite. Now, okay, let me just read it, then I'll, then I'll talk about it. So Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Look, my master has spared name in this Syrian while not receiving from his hands what he brought. Now, most of you know the story of Naaman, but let me catch you up to speed. Naaman was a, a second in command in a foreign land, and he had captured a, a Hebrew slave girl who became the nanny to his children. And, and she told him about this man of God in Israel who could heal his leprosy. He was a, a man who had leprosy. So he, he got permission from his king and gathered up all the stuff to pay the man of God with. And, and, he, and he rides for days and weeks and finally arrives at the man of God's camp. And the man of God just sent his servant out, said, go tell him to dip seven times in the Jordan River. Well, Na Naaman was furious. He, was, he, was, he said, look, I expected the man to at least come out and wave his arms over me or something. He didn't. He sends you out here, tells me to go dip seven times in the Jordan River. He goes, listen, I have rivers at home that are cleaner than the Jordan. If I was going to do that, I could have done it there, and it would all been good and fine. So he leaves. He's mad. But then this woman says, look, 
If he asked you to do something hard, wouldn't you have done it? Naaman goes, well, I suppose you're right. Just try it. So Naaman dipped seven times in the Jordan River, and he comes up, and his skin is just like one of these babies we had born this week. I mean, just pure, whole. So he goes back to the man of God's house and says, here, I'm going to give you all these things, the man of God. No, I don't want all those things. Take them back with you. Just go and serve the Lord. Well, Gehazi is a, is a servant of the man of God, of Elisha. He's a servant of Elisha. So he follows Naaman out of town. And he says this, look, my master has spared Naaman the Syrian while not receiving from his hands what he brought, but as the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. Now he went in and stood before his master. Elisha said to him, where did you go, Gehazi? And he said, your servant didn't go anywhere. So he follows Naaman, gathers up all these stuff, all this money, all these riches, all this wealth. And then he comes back to Elisha and Elisha said, where'd you go? Well, I didn't go anywhere. I didn't, I didn't do anything. I'm not guilty. I, I, didn't, I didn't do anything. Then Elisha said to him, did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? Is it time to receive money and to receive clothing and olive groves and vineyards and sheep and oxen and male and female servants? Therefore, Elisha said to Gehazi, the leprosy of Naaman will cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out from his presence, leprous as white as snow. So this man of God had an impartation of knowledge that he could in no way know that Gehazi was following after riches. Okay, let's talk about discerning of spirits. So I'm going to go through this quickly. I want you to pay attention to something here. There's no debate on whether there is, whether spirits really exist or not. Okay, the writer of the text believes that spirits are real. The universe we are a part of, both the visible and the invisible. God is the creator and sovereign of all. He's, he's Lord over it all. But Satan, <coughs> evil spirits, good angels, and human beings are all real, real creatures. And not everything you hear, not everything we see, not everything we witness is from God. And it's got to be tried, okay? It's got to be, it's got to be, there's got to be some test about whether it's genuine or not. We talked about this in the past. There's a huge difference between a good word and a God word. I'm for hearing from God. I don't know about you. Good words probably won't hurt us, but it, it needs to be a God word that we can hear and understand. It, it may just be human invention, or it could be worse. It could be demonic at its very root and core. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, we see this scripture, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. <clears throat> and then 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 to 14 says this, for such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transformed himself into an angel of light. Well, what does the Bible say? First of all, the word discerning means a judging through a distinguishing, the ability to pierce through the outward, to tear away mask, and to reach the motivating, animating source of power. So, so we're, 
We're looking beyond the mask. We're, we're pulling off the facade. We're, we're looking deeper into the heart and the meaning of what's going on. So the words discerning and spirits are both plural in the Greek, which tells us that the, this gift could be manifest in many, many ways. All right, so here's number one. Everything must conform to Scripture. Everything we say, everything we do, everything we preach, everything we proclaim, everything we share must conform to Scripture. If it doesn't conform to Scripture, it may be a good word, but it's not a God word. So number two, everything must glorify Christ. In John chapter 16, verse 14, he will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Number three, everything must reflect the character of God. Jude verse four says, for certain men have crept in unnoticed, not long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord and our Lord, the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And then down in verse 16 through 19, these are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lust, and their mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the Spirit. Everything must bring strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. Everything should edify the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 14, 3, but he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. There's a, there's a scriptural example that I want to give you, and then we're going to pray together. Acts chapter 13, verse 9 through 10. Paul discovers there's a man by the name of Elamas who withstood them and called him what he was and struck him with blindness. I want you to listen to this, verse 9. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of righteousness, Will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And then in Acts chapter 16, Paul again is, he and his entourage are walking through the city, preaching, proclaiming Jesus. Verse 16, it says this, Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Now, listen, there's nothing wrong with what she was saying. Nothing at all. What she said was accurate and right and right on. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Now I encourage you to go read the rest of that story because he had great trouble from the town folk who gained a lot of money by her soothsaying, by her interpreting by her, by her operating under this evil spirit. Paul cast her out, cast out the spirit, said in the name of Jesus, come out. Well, that was only by a discerning that there was something devious going on. It could be a good word, but we've got to be, we've got to be smart, We've got to be wise. We've got to operate in knowledge. 
and we learn to follow the will of God. Amen? So here's, here's the way I feel like God generally uses me in a prophetic utterance, a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. We, we had a guy in our church in Odessa. He would give an interpretation to a message in tongues and it would come out in King James English. And he was loud and boisterous and, and I'm not knocking that, I'm not making fun of him, but that's all that he studied, that's all that he knew, that's all that he understood was King James. And so every time he was operating the gifts of the Spirit, it would come out in King James. He was usually right on, but that was his personality. Well, here's the way I believe God uses me in that gift. It's, it's more like, I'll say something like this. Here's what I feel the Spirit of God is saying to us. Here's what I believe God wants you to know. Here's what I believe God is doing in our midst right now. And it's, it's not much louder than what I'm speaking right now. It's not much different, but... But I want you to know something. It doesn't matter how it comes out, just as long as it does, as long as we allow it. So yours may sound different. That's okay. Yours may look different. That's okay. As long as you know that you know that you know that it's by the Holy Spirit. It's all God. It's all good. And it's all wonderful because God is sovereign, and he is Lord over this house. Amen. 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 Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for using flesh like us to operate according to your spirit, to move according to your will, to, to be used by the spirit of God. Father, I pray that would, you would use us more and more and more as particularly as we see the day of the Lord approaching. Thank you, God, for your great power, presence. In Jesus' name, amen.
Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the spirit of discernment. Father, we thank you that we have and can possess the Holy Spirit and the fire of speaking in tongues, Lord. To go deeper into your presence, Father, into your word, into your promises, Lord. Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, for empowering us through grace to live holy. Father, we may not always get it right. We may mess up, and, but Father, it's the discernment that comes and it's your spirit within us that rises within us. Father, that when we doubt it, it's you who comes in and says, hold on, I got you. Hold on, here I am, this is the way. Father, we thank you this morning for living and coming alive in every one of us, Lord. Father, I just speak a blessing over everyone in this house this morning, Father, that you would be with them, that you cover them and their families, Lord. From the crown of their head to the soles of their feet, Lord. In Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen, amen. We'll see you guys next Sunday. Youth, we'll see you here Wednesday at 7 o'clock. God bless you guys. Wasn't that an amazing sermon? We are so glad that you joined us this morning. If you made a decision to follow Jesus, we would love to hear about it. If you would go to our website and click the guest tab, if you fill out your information, you can click whether you gave your life to the Lord for the very first time, or if you've decided to rededicate your life to the Lord. We want to celebrate with you. Also, if you're a first time guest and this is the first time you've tuned in to us, we'd love to know about that too. So if you'd go to that website as well and fill out that guest tab, we want to get to know you. We love you guys. We'll see you soon.